Welcome back to this week's Emily Show. Today we are heading back to Idaho because there have been a lot of developments in the Idaho college student murder case. There have been, well, two, three, there's three cases really. We've talked about the TikTok defamation case that's related to this. Today we are talking about new unsealed documents with regard to search warrants, attorney conflict, and then a large appeal that's going on with regard to the media trying to make sure that the gag order is yeeted from this case. And that is coming when there are a ton of things that have recently been filed under seal. So fights over the gag order, a court determination about attorney conflict, which I covered in other content, and then, of course, that unsealed search warrant. So we're going to go through all of it today. Emily, that's an ambitious amount of things to cover. Yeah, it really is. We'll, we're going to do mostly an overview of everything, more of a deep dive into the search warrant. And then if you want a deeper dive into any of the aspects, you just need to let me know and we will do another episode. But today we are doing an overview of everything that we have missed in this case over the last, well, six weeks, really, with regard to this case because of coverage well, over in South Carolina. And now that Murdaugh is done, we can move back on to Idaho. So let's get in to today's episode. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Adulting is hard, and I try to work with sponsors that make it just a little bit easier. And Policy Genius absolutely does that. It's one of those things we don't talk about a lot is what your life insurance looks like. And it's one of those things you might want to just set it and forget it. But how do you find it? Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. What does that mean for you? It means they're here to make it easier. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks and find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. The agents don't work for the life insurance companies. They're not incentivized to recommend one insurer over another. The incentive there is to find you the best policy so that you're happy. It's why they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. There are no added fees and your personal details are private. So if you want to get started today, your loved ones deserve a financial safety net and you deserve a better way to find it and buy it. Head to policygenius.com slash Lawnard, or click the link in the description down below to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. That's policygenius.com slash Lawnard. Now, let's get back into today's episode. First, we're going to go over the unsealed Pennsylvania search warrants. Uh, These have been recently unsealed by order of the court, but again, we're going to be getting into the non- dissemination order and the sealing of this case a bit more later on as we talk about the appeal over that non-dissemination order. But parts of the search warrant and search warrant returns have been unsealed from Pennsylvania. I'm interested to see what they took, what was searched. There are two of them that we're going to go over today together. I'm not going to go over the affidavits in full because they are based on the same information from the affidavits that we have seen before. So we are really looking at what was taken, what they were searching for, and what that might mean for the case, and to get an idea of how much information law enforcement might have about this case at this point in time. So we're going to just pull up the one that I have saved in my files first and go through it now. So this first one is from the state of Pennsylvania for the white 2015 Hyundai Elantra bearing the VIN number and they list it, bearing the license plate number and they list it, and then looking for specific items in that Elantra related to the homicide case. This search warrant was signed on the 29th of December, 2022. 
The date of search was December 30th at approximately 1.25 p.m. Was property seized? Yes, and we're going to go through the property that was seized. This is the filed search warrant return. So when a search warrant is done, the officers get the search warrant um, from a judge. It gets signed. They go and execute the search warrant. They take the things that they are allowed to take. They leave everything else alone ideally, and then they lodge the search warrant return with the court saying, these are the things that we found and these are the things that we took in the process of the search warrant. And going through that, they also um, state that they left property at the residence and then lifted listed what was left at the residence and where that residence is. So the items that were taken, and this is from the receipt for property, Dated 1230, what was collected and seized from the vehicle that was parked at the residence in Pennsylvania was a knife. Book with underlying on page, underlining on page 118, AT&T bill for Brian Koberger. Again, these that particularly is going to connect him to the vehicle because it's how do we even know it was his car? And then how do you know if his car was the car seen in video around the area. So they're going to be looking for things to tie him more closely to that vehicle and then tie that vehicle to the side. Um, an at and bill, so in the car, a Glock 22, um, 40 caliber with a serial number, Smith & Wesson pocket knife, folder containing vehicle paperwork, an Acer laptop. Oh, they're gonna love having a laptop. A green leafy substance in a green container a document, more green leafy substance in a plastic bag. Again, if the officers suspect that that is marijuana, then they're not going to list it until it's been drug tested. I don't know what the laws are in, in Pennsylvania. I know that that's not a problem in the state of Washington, but it can be a problem if it's not legal in the states you drive through to get from Washington to Pennsylvania with it. Uh, white paper with postcard. No, with passport, like a photocopy, maybe of a passport, a power cable, a cell phone, um, three Glock 40 caliber magazines, empty, book, uh, black face mask, prescription, black gloves, one black hat, one black mask, uh, personal identifying documents, new balance shoes, dark color jacket, dark colored jacket, dark color... Why is that listed 21, 22, and then 22 A, B, C, D, and 23 A? There's a lot of clothing listed. Dark color jackets, dark color shoes, dark color shirt. No, those all say shirt. Dark color pants. All listed as different item numbers. A clear plastic glove. Um, I have no idea what item number 26 is. One something with damage. Um or two somethings with damage listed a receipt or it looks like a record of sale for a Glock 22 Gen 40 caliber, a photograph, um, a note, a criminal psychology book. It's in parentheses, quote, criminal psychology book. Um, another, it looks like a book title um, from a different university. Then 33 X or oh, item number 33 is an extra large Columbia Navy fleece. Oh, this is harder to read than I thought. A hand drawing, an ID inside of the glove box, a dune. <laughs> Does that say dune colored hat? D U N E. It looks like dune colored hat, black gloves. Interesting that they didn't say sand, they said dune. They said dune. Black gloves, a Seagate one, tera dri one terabyte Samsung solid state drive. Oh, they're going to be real happy with the police are going to be real happy with that solid state drive once they get into it. A black box Samsung uh, with Intel something in the box. I don't know. Is that a phone? Might be a phone. I'm not sure. Two pairs of black gloves, one black hat, dark green short sleeve shirt, and then other clothing items, a lot of other clothing items, a motherboard. A Washington State, uh, Washington State University paperwork, a note from Brian to Montana, Craftsman Shop something, um, medical documents, court documents, a note to dad from Brian. What are these notes going to be? 
What are these notes going to be? Interesting. Note to dad from Brian, a maroon colored spiral notebook, dark colored clothes, an HP 100 all in one computer. That's two computers. A Linux laptop and password. Hmm. Was the password written on a post-it note on the laptop? Like a Lenovo something pad laptop. That's three laptops. Interesting. Um, Another desktop. That's four. Or at least that looks like it's a desktop with a serial number. Um, Oh, Dune might have been dark. Because there's another one that says dark clothes and laundry basket. And it looks the same. Uh, Taylor cutlery knife with leather sheath. And then swabs. Those are going to be um, swabbing for blood or DNA. So those are going to be swabs taken from the car. A pair of dark color boots and a pair of brown boots. So we have at least three laptops. Something that looks like it could be a cell phone. That black box Samsung. And one one terabyte Samsung solid state drive. And was there another drive? We've also got um, empty magazines, a gun, several knives, and a lot of black clothing. So it's going to be very interesting to see what comes back on those swabs in the car. And what that's a lot of clothing in the car. This was a while after he returned back to Pennsylvania. So the clothing wasn't in his father's house, which was interesting. And as I've mentioned before, I do record these behind the scenes with our members who pointed out to me that I missed that item number 47 was a craftsman shop vac. It's very hard to read, but item 47 is absolutely a craftsman shop vac. So we have multiple laptops, a damaged laptops, multiple knives, a gun, multiple pairs of black clothing, black gloves, black masks, hats. So they are going to look for all of the things in this car. What's interesting is that he has gone to stay at his father's house and all of this is still in the car. It's a lot of tech to leave parked in a vehicle, especially if you're not parking it in a garage. So I wonder what the destroyed level of the laptop is. Like, did the laptop look like somebody had taken a hammer to it? or like a, a drill to it, or was it damaged like from a normal dropping? I'll be very interested to see how this plays out. Again, we are getting to the preliminary hearing in this case in June. It is going to be a multiple day preliminary hearing. That's the next date in this case. But we have another search warrant from the state of Pennsylvania to go through and see what they took. This is everything that was taken and we didn't finish this search warrant. Emily, close the loop. This is everything that was taken from the Elantra parked at the property. In what they were looking for, they were looking for, and this is on the later pages after the search warrant return, what they were searching for in the Hyundai, the Hyundai Elantra was blood or other bodily fluids or materials, and items with blood or other bodily fluids or materials on it or near them, knives, sheaths, or other weapons, documents, records, medications, drugs, or other substances, any property belonging to the victims, and then it names them, document records, data compilations related to the location um, on King Road or any of the victims, clothing to include but not limited to dark shirts, pants, masks, shoes with a diamond sole pattern, DNA, footprints, fingerprints, fibers, animal or human hair or other physical trace evidence or items bearing those, the shop vac might fall into that category, four samples of Koberger's DNA, bibuccal swab, buccal swab, however you want to pronounce it, alcoholic beverage or other intoxicant containers or receipts, interesting, data compilations relating to or containing information indicating, suggesting or relating to violence, stabbing, a fight, motive or hostility for the same. And then it goes on to list that any electronic devices to be searched. Um, that includes emails, texts, application, storage notes, voicemails, all of the digital things live and deleted electronic user data, which means this search warrant is going to cover them for a lot of the stuff to be recovered from the devices that they got because it asked for all of that, whether they'll get a separate search warrant to actually search the devices once they've re received the devices We'll see. They might. They might not need to. This will cover it. It depends on where those things are done. 
They talk about indicia of residency, ownership, or possession in the vehicle. I talked about that a little earlier when I saw what they took. And then it went through the affidavit from what those in Pennsylvania were told by those in Idaho from that same statement of Brett Payne that we saw related to the other search warrants. That search warrant affidavit was unsealed earlier on. That's when we first learn about um, the roommates and what was seen and what was heard was when that was unsealed and I covered that in other content. Let's go cover the other search warrant in Pennsylvania. And this one's gonna be a little bit shorter. The second search warrant is a search warrant for the person. If you followed my coverage of the Duggar case, there were a lot of pretrial motions about whether or not law enforcement had a warrant or should have had a warrant to take photographs of Josh Duggar's hands and other body parts when he was arrested, if those were part of the booking procedure or if a search warrant for his person was needed. So what we're seeing here is a search warrant for the person of Brian Koberger when he is arrested. So this search warrant is going to be asking for similar things to the other one in relation to taking DNA and what have you. So this is the receipt for property collected. This is the Honda Elantra. Um, and it says swabs, Ziploc bag with phone zipper, seven to nine quart plastic baggie with green zipper, 36 drives, or sorry, 36 dimes, 32 nickels, eight pennies, gloves, receipts, car insurance card, car registration, hiking boots, Comfort in room, key holder, and stay information, tire iron, shovel, goggles, floor mats, reflective vest, used water bottles, wrench, door panels, seats and seat cushions, headrest, seatbelt, visor, fiber, back pedal, gas pedal, phone charger, band-aid, wrappers, maps, documents, seat belt, boot. So those are things that they collected and took from the Honda. These are things they are going to use to test for um, DNA, among other things. So that was additional things taken from the Honda Elantra, even though this was listed as the search warrant. Did I read it wrong? It was listed as the search warrant for um, the person of Brian Koberger. So interesting that they added the vehicle to this search warrant at one point, or they're just listing the items collected from the Elantra to be the foundation of this search warrant of the person, but the search warrant of the person is going to allow them to take DNA. So I'm looking for the receipt on that. Um, identify items to be searched for and seized. The person of Brian, Brian Koberger. Oh, this might just be the arrest warrant, <laughs> but it, it's odd that it's listed as a search warrant. Um, no, there would be an arrest warrant separate. This is where's the return on this. This is why we do things contemporaneously. So you can hear me listen to like, where is the return? The return should be the DNA, but that was listed on the other return, which is odd to me that they've listed this as a search warrant for the, I have questions. They've listed this as a search warrant for the person. And yet all the things they have listed are things that they took from the Hyundai Elantra on what date was this? This was at a later date and time. So this is 1230 at four after four o'clock. I wonder if they just added this. That's odd to me that they added this to the collected and seized um, to the search warrant for the person. And then they put the search warrant return on the other one. So this one is the search warrant um, being done at 435 or no later than 435 p.m., and this is the search warrant for the person, but the return gives a whole bunch of the return summary from the uh, Hyundai. Interesting to me. Why wouldn't you just say that you took the DNA in this search warrant return? Why put it in the other search warrant return? I don't know. When we go through things contemporaneously, <laughs> sometimes they're confusing. Let's move on. We have lots more to cover today. After a thank you to our sponsor, we're going to talk a bit more about attorney conflict. Well, spring is trying to spring, and at least the time change has sprung forward. But you know what it's time for? A little spring cleaning on that beard. Are you team beard? I'm team beard. I love Dr. B's beard. And you know what a beard needs to stay glorious? Manscaped. That's absolutely right. I could hear you saying it with me. Beard Hedger Pro Kit. And it comes with everything you need to groom a beard 
and keep it nice and snugly and soft. The Pro Kit starts off with the Beard Hedger, which is a waterproof cordless trimmer with rotary wheel that has 20 cutting lengths, all with one guard. It also has titanium coated blades that are tough on hair, but smooth on faces. But the kit also comes with beard shampoo and conditioner, the beard oil and beard balm. And you get three free gifts in that kit, which include the beard brush, which is a favorite at my house, as well as a little comb that works perfectly with the scissors to get all those strays. So the beard is always ready to impress. So save 20% and get free shipping with code Lawnard. That's 20% and free shipping with code Lawnard at manscaped.com. Help get the beard in your life ready for spring. Let's get back to today's episode. In previous content, I talked about the conflict issues with regard to public defender and Taylor, Brian Koberger's appointed public defender and other clients that she had represented and had ceased representation from. Clients that were parents of victims in this case that was done at a hearing that was in chambers that had been sealed on which none of us knew about until they unsealed it so on february 24th 2023 that was filed with redactions after a motion to unseal it this also comes up in the appeal that we're going to be talking about shortly but in this case there is a memo that has been now with redactions unsealed about what happened at the hearing with regard to the conflict of attorney Ann Taylor. If you want my thoughts on that conflict and the conflicts that existed, I think in the Murdoch case, you can go check out that episode. We will list it down below. This filing says, come now, the state of Idaho by and through the Latah County prosecuting attorney um, and the above named defendant by and through its undersigned attorney stipulate to the court unsealing the attached redacted copy of the memo summarizing a January 13th chambers conference, which was filed under seal on January 20th, 2023. So the hearing was on the 13th. They filed this memo under seal on the 13th, and now we're seeing it. The redactions are pursuant to the Idaho court administrative rule 32 I2D in that given the extent of threats and harassment of potential witnesses, disclosure of the redacted potential witnesses' names and their representatives' names at this time might um, threaten or endanger their safety. So that is their reasoning for keeping parts of this under seal. And let's go through it. The following is a summary of the in-chambers Zoom meeting with Judge Marshall on January 13th, 2023. The following attorneys were present. Bill Thompson, the prosecutor, Ashley Jennings, senior deputy prosecutor, um, blank, attorney for blank, co-counsel attorney for blank, redacted, attorney for redacted, then uh, Shannon Gray, attorney for the Gonsalves family, and Ann Taylor, public defender for Brian Koberger. Judge Marshall's clerk was also present. This meeting was off the record. Judge Marshall read the substantive parts of the non-dissemination order that was issued on January 3rd. 2023, Judge Marshall reminded the parties that the order mirrors the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct 3.6, which she then read. Interestingly enough, this is going to come up in the appeal saying, look, the non-dissemination order is not needed. The Rules of Professional Conduct cover this. A broader non-dissemination order is overbroad, and that's why the press, the AP and others, are seeking to have it yeeted. It goes on to say Judge Marshall directed everyone's attention to the commentary for the rule, specifically subparagraphs one and three. The judge states her reading of the commentary three leads her to believe that the rule applies to all lawyers participating in the Zoom meeting. This includes not only the state and the defense, but also attorneys for witnesses. The judge directed everyone's attention to the commentary for the rule, paragraphs five and six, or five and seven. After reviewing the rule, the judge explained that for the purpose of the meeting or the purpose of the meeting was in response to what she has been seeing and hearing from various media sources. So the judge wants to talk to the lawyers based on things that the judge has seen in the media. If you think the judges don't see this stuff, they absolutely do. It's one of the things that causes me concern when there's fuckery in cases because they're streamed, like bomb threats being called in in two of the cases that I've covered recently. It's 
concerning to me that judges will be more and more worried about the propriety of the court proceedings and that that public part, the public trial part, is going to get lost in the mix, which I think would be, well, unconstitutional and a travesty. The court goes on to say she has tried to ignore most media covering the case since she will be presiding over the preliminary hearing. This case has garnered national and international attention. This is a high-profile case, and she wants to remind all attorneys not to engage in any conduct that would interfere with a fair trial. Because of the nature of the case, this will be a long process. She further advised it is not the responsibility of the attorneys in this case to disseminate information to the media. She is not ordering clients, i.e. witnesses, not to talk to the media, but stressed this case should not be tried in the media, but in the court of law. The judge is not here for the court of public opinion. Lawyers involved need to, quote, take their duties in utmost regard. Oh, the judge was scolding them when conducting themselves and advising their clients. Oh, scolding the the witness and victim families, attorneys, because those are the attorneys that have talked. The other attorneys haven't talked. Judge Marshall stated she wanted to make sure her expectation, she wanted to make her expectations clear regarding the lawyer's ethical duties described above. Reiterating it again, if lawyers fail to adhere to their ethical duties, she will have to either find them in contempt of her order and or report their actions to the Idaho State Bar. I imagine this judge will do both. Oh, the judge does not like the things that were leaked to the media. However, it wasn't just attorneys. The media, well, I can't say that for sure. I wonder what's going on that makes her believe the attorneys are leaking the information because a lot of information has come from sources close to the investigation. And does the court or have the attorneys given the court information that the victim and witness attorneys, their family attorneys, have been given this information from law enforcement and then this information becomes public. It seems like that's what the court is concerned about here. It goes on to say, Shannon Gray responded that he reached out after the non-dissemination order was issued asking for clarification and he did not receive a response. This is the Gonsalves family attorney. He asked if the order precludes victims and witnesses from speaking. Judge, or It says victims slash witnesses. Judge Marshall reiterated that her order does not preclude witnesses from speaking. Redacted responded that he expects his client redacted will be a witness in the case. He also expects that the um, decedent's families will be witnesses if or will be witnesses in this case since it is a potential capital case and they would be called to testify. He has handled numerous homicide cases, including capital cases during his career. He assures the court that he has advised his client, redacted, to decline all media and will continue to do that. He and his client, um, he and his client and will not comment as it would be inappropriate to comment. The judge appreciates redacted's perspective. The judge reiterates she is not saying that clients cannot talk to the media, but does question whether it is wise for them to talk to the media. You can't tell them not to talk to the media. You can't tell witnesses not to talk to the media. So instead, the judge is like, well, I can't tell you what to do, but it's unwise. It goes on to say that the judge reminds the lawyers they have a responsibility in giving advice to their clients. Sounds like the judge is telling the lawyers, remember to tell them it's unwise for them to speak to the media. It goes on to say if any lawyer has questions about this or takes issue with any of this, they should contact the Idaho State Bar and seek clarification. Go talk to the bar. Let them tell you how the rules of professional conduct work. It seems like the court has made it pretty clear their feelings on the rules of professional conduct and pretrial media. Shannon Gray speaks about emailing the state and wanting to contact the court to seek clarification. Mr. Gray stated he would seek clarity from the Idaho State Bar. The judge responded that she appreciates Mr. Gray reaching out, but that she has a, she has had limited um, accessibility with a full court calendar. This is why she scheduled the meeting. Mr. Gray discusses the PC affidavit and alleges that information is getting leaked from the prosecutor's office. 
Judge Marshall reminds the parties about the Idaho Rules of Professional Conduct 3.6 and the lawyer's duties. The lawyers should not be speculating. Ooh, this on memo sounds a little snappy. And this judge, by way of reminder, only has any sway over the Idaho attorneys, right? This judge is not talking to the defense attorney in Pennsylvania directly, <laughs> right? But this is the, the attorney speculated that information is getting leaked from the prosecutor's office. And the memo says that the judge reminds the lawyers that they should not be speculating. And the judge clarifies that the public record is what's in the court's case file, not information reported by the media. This got snappy. The judge clarifies that attorneys are not prohibited from advising their clients, but they are prohibited from speaking to the media. Example, you can advise your client about what might happen at a status hearing, but you shouldn't you should not be speculating what will happen to the media. <laughs> like, like the Pennsylvania defense attorney did. If you want to see my content covering that, it's over on YouTube. Mr. Gray takes issue with the interpretation of, quote, substantially prejudices, referring to substantial likelihood of material prejudicing and adjudicative proceeding in the matter. States his client, Gonsalves, have kept, quote, this story alive and that their, quote, comments have helped the investigation. Oh, my. So the attorney for the victim's family is snapping back to the judge that the judge's interpretation of the rules of professional conduct are overbroad, that them speaking to the media does not substantially prejudice the case, and that, in fact, their clients speaking, quote, kept this story alive and that their quote comments have helped the investigation. Oh boy. The judge explains the necessity of convening an impartial jury in Lake County. The public is obsessed with this case and comments are harming the ability to impanel a jury. We're definitely getting a behind the scenes peek of what these courts are worried about when it comes to public trials. All parties need to allow the judicial process to see this case through. That even reads snappy. Maybe I've just worked with a lot of judges, but that even reads snappy. Mr. Gray responds that it is unrealistic to believe, oh shit. Ooh. Counsel's responding to the court now. This is the Gonsalves family attorney responding back to the court in a memo that has been unsealed but is still redacted saying that they believe it's unrealistic to believe that we will find a jury in the U.S. that hasn't heard about this case. Snappy. Mr. Gray takes issue that he was not given a lot of notice that we would be having this meeting. He was not given enough time to prepare. Ooh. Judge Marshall reminds the parties that the Constitution still applies in this case. Oh, shit. Lawyers have a duty to uphold the system and to allow the system to see the case through. So this attorney is pushing back on the judge, saying that the judge's interpretation, again, of the rules of professional conduct regarding substantially prejudice um, is, is overbroad. I'm not surprised that we're seeing this, given that that attorney has also been very involved in the appeal that we're going to be talking about briefly after we finish this. The judge reminds the parties that the Constitution still applies. Um, someone else, redacted, reminds Mr. Gray that he is creating a record by his media interactions. Oh, so this is a scolding of the attorney. We've gotten to the point. I mean, we kind of all read between the lines. We were all thinking the same thing, weren't we? Whoever is redacted reminds Mr. Gray that he's creating a record by his media interactions. His statements are being captured by the defense. All of his statements impact the case and advise Mr. Gray to exercise restraint. Mr. Gray takes issue with redacted's advice. The judge stops any argument. Oh, the argument had already started. The judge stops any further argument. <laughs> oh, shit. 
The judge solicits final comments from those in attendance. The prosecutor states that many of Mr. Gray's accusations are not true. The state is, well, many? Which ones are true? Excuse me, counsel? Excuse me, we'd like to know which of the accusations are true because this case is redacted to all hell. It is highly sealed, and we would like to just know what's going on. Could you tell us which ones? Damn it. The prosecutor states that many of Mr. Gray's accusations are not true. The state is concerned about the ability to impanel a jury and have a fair trial. He is hopeful that all parties will begin to show professional responsibility. <laughs> oh, shit. That's a... Um, that's a, maybe you should act like an adult then, kind of a comment from the prosecutor. Maybe everyone will start to show up like professionals. Snap. Redacted states that she has advised Redacted not to comment. She takes Redacted position. I'm not going to comment further. And Taylor thanks the court and expresses appreciation. The defense attorney was like, leave me the fuck out of all of this. I am done. So clearly there is tension brewing among these attorneys. And it seems right now that the sides that we are dealing with are team in court, the judge, the defense, and the prosecution, and well, the media and the attorneys for the witness and victims. It seems that that, are, that is the tension that is building here, and it's kind of blowing up around the non-dissemination order and around these hearings. But even though the prosecution and defense had agreed to transparency in this issue, a lot has happened in court that is not transparent. And after a word from our sponsor, we are going to talk about everything that has been sealed recently in this case. As the weather gets warmer, it always is a good time to talk about shapewear that is comfortable and breathable. I know I have some family events and more formal events to get back to this year. And one of the things that keeps it all together for me is Honey Love. Honey Love has what you need for the girls with support from below, not just hinging them off of your shoulders with their 360 bonded compression bodysuits that smooths the tummy and the hips, and even that back bit where the bra hits, yep, that. And it has built-in bust support that lifts the girls without underwire. I know, yes, it's true. Yes, I've tried it. It's shapewear that's comfortable, but still makes you feel held. And it is easy to use the restroom in it so you are not struggling in a bathroom because you know we're gonna have to use the bathroom at some point. Hydration is key. So from bras to tanks and shapewear of all kinds and incredibly comfortable sleepwear, take a look at Honey Love and take this discount seriously because you're gonna wanna buy all the things I just did. It's time to treat yourself to the best shapewear on the market at 20% off and you also support the show. Go to honeylove.com code lawnard. That's honeylove.com code lawnard. Lawnard. Trust me on this one. Your girls will thank you. All right, let's get back to the rest of today's show. I am going to go through one of the many sealing orders so that we have an idea of what's being sealed, but these are subpoenas for mostly tech that are being sealed. I think it's very interesting what they're going after. So with that, let us go through this sealing order to Apple Inc. Emily, why did you um, pick Apple Inc.? Well, <laughs> it was the first one and it's the most interesting. Okay, order to seal. This matter came before the court on February 10th, 2023 on the court's motion to seal or redact pursuant to um, ICAR 32I. The hearing was held via Zoom. The Prosecutors appeared on behalf of the state, defense on behalf of Koberger to review the records, considered the uh, the court reviewed the records, considered the arguments presented, weighed the interest of the privacy and public disclosure, and announced its finding as a fact on the record. Therefore, pursuant to ICAR 32 I2A and D and um, IC 74-124-1C, the court finds it necessary to seal the records related to the search warrant for the following reasons. 
The documents contain highly intimate facts or statements, the publication of which would be highly objectionable to a reasonable person. The documents contain facts or statement that might threaten the safety or endanger the life or safety of individuals. Disclosure would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. This motion and this record has been made for dozens of search warrants to different types of companies. So this one is to Apple. There are a number of them where they are seeking um, to get information from Apple and they are filing an order under seal and they are asking the return be filed under seal. With that, we are going to go through the extensive list of what it is. What I am pulling up is the case summary and the listing of items from this case. So when we go to February 28th, we see the order temporary sealing, and then we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight orders to seal. And then we see order to seal and redact to Amazon, American Express, four to Apple, two to AT&T, one to Bank of America, one to Banner Band, one to something that just says block, one to Blue Ridge Knives, one to Charter Communications, Corday Lane, Corday Lane, did I say that right? Maybe not. Police Department Forensic Lab, Discover Bank, Dropbox, two to eBay, one to Elaine Financial Services, Elaine, Elan, E-L-A-N, either way. Idaho Central Credit Union, Idaho Department of Labor, Numerica Credit Union, um, Potlatch, number one financial credit union, Mbika Bank, Wells Fargo. There was a motion in there to appoint co-counsel. Sidebar, Ann Taylor has been given approval to have an additional attorney on her team. That makes sense. We haven't seen who that is yet, but Ann Taylor is allowed to bring in another um, capital case qualified defense attorney. We are now on March 7th, order to seal to Verizon, Washington State University, DoorDash, Extreme Networks, two to Google, one to Inland Cellular, one to K-Bar Knives, K-Bar Knives, K-Bar Knives, K-Bar, K-A-B-A-R. Um, we know that the sheath that was found in the residence after the murders was from that brand. One, two, three, four, five to Match Group. Is that Match.com? parent company. I think it might be. Um, let's see this. Oh, wait, this one's to meta, but I tapped on match. I thought I did anyway. Um, match group, LLC, Tinder records, Tinder. So I wonder if these are for, um, are match and Tinder under the same, wait, are match and Tinder K bar. Thank you all. Are match and Tinder, um, owned by the same parent company? They might be. So one, one, two, three, four, five by Match Group LLC. I need to know who Match Group LLC owns now. According to Reuters, Match Group Inc. through its portfolio of companies provides digital technologies. Its portfolios of brands include Tinder, Hinge, Matt, Meatsick, OkCupid, Pears, Plenty of Fish, Azar, Hukana, and other brands. So it is Match and Tinder, and Hinge, and Pears, and OkCupid, and the rest of them. Online dating. Online dating apps. The subpoenas for the online dating. Oh, they're going to be looking for all of the DMs on any of those dating apps. And it is one, two, three, four, five different search warrants, which is going to go to everybody. It's going to go to all the apps. But they must then have probable cause to get to these things. So they must have been on the phone or the computer or one of the things that they saw. Interesting. They're also one, two, three, four, five, six to meta platforms. So that is everything from Facebook to Instagram, everything under the meta portfolio. One to the Moscow Police Department, one to PayPal Venmo, one to Reddit. And we've heard a lot about... of. We've heard a lot of speculation that perhaps he had posted things on Reddit. So one to Reddit, two to Snap Inc., which is going to have your Snapchat, two to T-Mobile, uh, another one to uh, Umpoka Bank. No, 
Umpaka? U-M-P-Q-U-A? Oh, I forgot to put this back up. One to UPS, two more to Verizon Wireless, one to Walmart, one to Yahoo, one to Yik Yak, and two to Google. All of the search warrant, all of the search warrants for tech, for banking, for just about everything else that you can imagine. So on this case, we will see some of that, I think, at the preliminary hearing. Let's talk about the preliminary hearing real quick and what to expect. The preliminary hearing in this case has been set between 626 and 630. So four days, five days of preliminary hearing in this case. It will probably be disseminated in some way. I will be doing everything I can to get that ASAP so we can all go through it together. So if there is a pool feed, we will be working on that. So in June, mark your calendars, June 26th through the 30th, we're going to be in Idaho in June, folks. Yes, yes, we'll be in New Mexico in May and then Idaho in June. But let's talk about the appeal a little bit before we wrap for today. On February 6, 2023, the Associated Press and a whole bunch of others filed, and I've been calling it the appeal, technically they're filing seeking a writ of mandamus or a writ of prohibition. So technically they took a writ. Yes, I keep saying they took an appeal. Why? Because the appellate court determines these things. And in my brain, I keep saying it. It's the Supreme Court of the state of Idaho that's going to be considering this. So should I say they took a writ? Yes. Has it been, <laughs> is it completely accurate to say they're seeking an appeal? No. What they're seeking is a writ. I have been using writ and appeal in this episode synonymously. They are not used synonymously. So apologies if there was any confusion. It is a technically a petition for writ, but they are taking it up to the, the appellate court of the land asking to yeet the court's decision. So the Associated Press at all are asking the court to issue a peremptory writ ordering the Lataw County District Court and the judge to vacate the amended non-dissemination order. Yeet. They are asking the court to yeet the non-dissemination order. They're saying that there's no history of extrajudicial statements or extrajudicial statements that would prejudice Koberger's right to a fair trial, that his attorney and prosecutors stipulated to the gag order prohibiting um, everyone from speaking, that the court should apply the strict scrutiny standard to it. So let's just take a look real quick at everyone that's covering this or everyone that's filing for this writ as a group. The Associated Press, Radio Television Digital News Association, Sinclair Media of Boise, LLC, which is K-Boy TV, the McClathy Company, LLC, States Newsroom, DBA, Idaho Capital Sun, the Seattle Times, um, KREM Spokane, KTVB Boise, King Seattle, East Idaho News.com, the Lewiston Tribune, Washington State Association of Broadcasters, Adams or Adams Publishing Group, DBA Post Register, Idaho Press Club, Idaho Education News, KXLY TV4 News Now, and KAPP slash KVU TV, Morgan Murphy Media, which is KXLY TV4. Scripps Media Inc., DBA, KIVI TV, a Delaware corporation, Boise, Seattle Public Radio, The Times News, The Spokesman Review, The Cordaline, Cordaline, Cordaline uh, Press, The New York Times Company, Day 365, DBA, Vo Boise Dev, Law News, N-E-W-Z, Law News Inc., Scripps Media Inc., a Delaware corporation. Scripps is in charge of um, Court TV. ABC Inc., WP Company, LLC, DBA, The Washington Post. Society of Professional Journalists <laughs> versus the Second Judicial District of the State of Idaho, County of Lataw, Honorable Megan E. Marshall, Magistrate Judge. So they are taking a writ against the judge to try to yeet the order or have the Supreme Court say that non-dissemination order violates the law. It is overbroad. It needs to, less restrictive methods are available to achieve the same thing and protect a fair trial. So yeet it. 
Interested parties have come into this case, including the attorney that we saw fighting back with the judge in the Zoom call, the attorney for the Gonzalez family. But Brian Koberger has also entered the chat as an interested party and has filed a um, has filed their own response to this as an interested party. So not only do we have Koberger opposing this writ, but the prosecution is opposing the writ. So we have numerous parties involved in the criminal aspect of this case opposing the writ. And then we have the media and the Gonsalves family attorney asking for this writ. So we're going to take a look real quick at Brian Koberger's interested party brief in opposition. We're going through the introduction of Koberger's brief to ask the court to deny the writ of mandamus to not yeet the non-dissemination order. If you would like a deeper dive into this writ, let me know in the comments, let me know in the reviews of the podcast, and we will get into it. But this has already been a long episode made longer by the fact that there is a third part of this. The introduction is really where we get most of their argument anyway, so we're going to go through that part. The introduction says free speech and fair trials are two of the most cherished policies of our civilization, and it would be a trying task to choose between them. This is from Bridges versus California in 1941. The court need not engage in the delicate balancing of those rights where the sole basis of the claimed infringement is access to interviews by the media. For the rights of the media to gather information are no greater than those of the general public. This case involves the duty of the court counsel for the accused and the prosecutor to safeguard the rights of the parties to a fair and impartial jury trial. On January 18th, 2023, respondent Judge Marshall entered an amended non-dissemination order in which the state of Idaho, or in the case state of Idaho versus Brian Koberger, the underlying criminal case, which orders that, and I'm not going to read it because we've gone through it. The declaration of Wendy J. Olson regarding the amended non-dissemination order that order was issued after an in-chambers meeting between the parties and the attorneys for the victims' families. We went through that. Things got quite snappy. The Declaration of Deborah Ferguson, Exhibit A. While many may claim to be bound by the amended non-dissemination order, footnote one, the order specifically limits the speech of attorneys for any interested party, any attorney representing a witness, victim, or victim's family, investigators, law enforcement personnel, and agents for the prosecuting attorney or defense attorney in line with rule 3.6 of the Idaho rules of professional conduct. Following the entry of the amended non-dissemination order, the petitioners in this case, approximately 30 media companies filed for the issuance of a writ of mandamus or writ of prohibition <clears throat> to vacate or nullify the amended gag order. This case, however, is not about a restriction on speech of the press, a contempt order or the closure of a court proceeding footnote two but the safeguarding of the right to fair trial by an impartial jury and the incidental effects of the amended non-dissemination order on the petitioner's ability to interview certain trial participants. Footnote two states, see Nebraska Press Association versus Stewart addressing an order which specifically restricted the press from publishing or broadcasting a confession and bridges relating to contempt proceedings and fines by the court for comments related to pending litigation and another case, Press and Turco versus Superior Court of California, holding that there is a qualified First Amendment right to access to criminal hearings. So they're saying this is distinguishable. We're not closing court proceedings. We're just not allowing some attorneys to be interviewed. First, the petitioners are not entitled to the writs because their First Amendment rights have not been infringed by the incidental effects of the amended non-dissemination order. The petitioners are free to seek interviews from witnesses and observe the court proceedings in the underlying case. This court should follow the reasoning of the Ninth and Second Circuits of uh, of the Ninth and Second Circuit Court of Appeals in Radio and Television News Association of Southern California versus U.S. District Court. This comes up a lot. This is not this is not new to the courts. Even if the court were to expand the powers of the media to attack lawful orders in criminal cases, which bind those parties involved. To the rules of professional conduct, the amended non-dissemination order meets the dictates of strict scrutiny because the order addresses the serious and imminent threat that unrestricted extrajudicial statements pose 
in a case surrounded by intense publicity, is narrowly drawn to trial participants, and is the least restrictive alternative, and the court might well find that. Finally, the court should not create a First Amendment right which has not been recognized, the right to access or interview to trial participants. Thus, the responder intervener requests that the court deny the petition for the, for the writ of uh, mandamus or writ of prohibition. And that is coming from Brian Koberger. So Brian Koberger, the prosecutors, and those interested in the case has stepped in saying this is not a case where the press is being denied their right to cover the case, denied access to the case or the courtroom. The non-dissemination order applies to the participants of the case and it binds them back to the rules that they are otherwise obligated to. It is going to be very interesting to see what the Supreme Court decides to do with this non-dissemination order and how long it takes them to get to it. But so far, we've had quite a lot of filings in this writ case, and I'm happy to cover them more thoroughly and talk about the rights of media versus the right to a fair trial, really, the right to an impartial jury and the balancing of the two. It's a conversation that we've started having a lot across my coverage of cases and how modern day media and social media coverage can play into finding a truly um, impartial jury and what that actually looks like in these cases. But Brian Koberger, through his attorneys, is fighting to keep that non-dissemination order in place. This case has been heavily locked down, more so than most of the cases we have covered thus far. I would love to know your thoughts on that because this should be a conversation Law is a conversation, and on days like today, law is a large and long conversation. These are big rights. These are big problems that we have to tackle. What is the role of our new media in a system that was put in place long, long before any of this existed? What I will say, though, to that is that trials have always been open. People have always had town squares and ways to disseminate information. We can just do it much faster and much more effectively to much many more people now. And the courts need to figure out the balance for that because, again, the right to an impartial jury is absolute, but so is your right to speech. So I want to know your thoughts on all of this conversation. How do you think we move forward in the age of social media and public trials? What's our role in all of this anyway as we watch these trials unfold? And how do you find a jury that's never heard about these cases? It's a little different in a small community, and we saw that in the Murdoch case. I would love to know your thoughts. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. I can't wait to talk to you next week. We have so much to cover. I hope you have an amazing week. And with that, may your, may your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May, you know, daylight saving not completely fuck your next couple of weeks and screw up everyone's sleep schedule. Me, it's me. I'm the problem. It's me. May your families be well and may the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you in the next one. You can find more Law Nerd goodness in our private Law Nerd community over at lawnerdsunite.com. And if you want to stay up to date with everything I'm covering, you can follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I recap those streams for those of you a little pressed for time over on the Quick Bits podcast and Quick Bits YouTube channel. Thanks for being a law nerd.